Well, good morning, everybody. This is Palm Sunday, and we're excited about what God has for us this morning. Um, if you're in the foyer or somewhere else, come on in. And if you're watching online, I hope you're ready to experience God's presence this morning. Well, this is Palm Sunday, and uh, I don't know, you know, these days when you look around at the news, don't you just wish that somebody would just step in and stop all the craziness, stop all the wars, stop all the dictators and the bombs and everything else, right? Well, that's certainly what was expected on Palm Sunday. A day when we remember the king of the universe riding into Jerusalem on a donkey. And I'm sure there were many people wondering why was he riding on a donkey. Now, of course, there are lots of people that would have been thinking back to Zechariah and prophecies that prophesied the Messiah on a donkey. But they were still expecting him to wipe out the Romans, right? They wanted a military coup. And I know we wish that Jesus would just ride in here and just solve it all. And yet, he comes in riding a donkey. Jesus said in John 14, verse 27, Peace I leave with you. My peace I give you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Remember that. I don't give you peace like the world gives. Don't let your hearts be troubled by all the stuff going on around us. And do not be afraid. Jesus wants us to walk by faith. Amen? Amen. And we have a great God that gives us the strength and the power to walk by faith. And not by sight. So let's not focus on our phones and the news and all the stuff in this world. And let's come to Jesus this morning to serve him. So let's come and experience a God who takes away our fears. Let's stand together as Haram comes to lead us this morning. Let's sing with all your heart. Before you sit down, greet somebody in the name of the Lord. And aren't you glad that Gabriel's back? <laughs> you don't know how many people are happy to have you back. Thank you. And anything you want to know about any of the new people, I can tell you. Yeah, that's okay. <laughs>
Got too busy visiting. It's great. A few announcements. We'll start things off with a little video. A lot of you guys have been asking about Vic. So I went to visit him in the hospital and uh, have this little video, if we can get it going. There you go. Just a second. So, so for those of you who didn't know, Vic, who often leads worship, he broke his pelvis. And so he is in the Rocky View Hospital. He doesn't have to have surgery because his pelvis, not his hip. Uh, they will, he doesn't have to go to rehab. He'll go straight home, probably Monday, and probably four to six weeks of recovery. So the silver lining in this is it forces some of us to step up a little bit. So we'll see what God does for us in the next few weeks with our worship. But we will definitely miss him. Ready to go? Okay, go for it. So I'm just here with Vic in the hospital. Unfortunately, we, he broke his pelvis and gets to eat hospital food for a little bit. Do you have anything you wanted to say to the people, Vic? Well, I want to thank everyone for their prayers. I appreciate it very much. And I'm going to miss you for the next few weeks because I will have to be away for to recuperate. But uh, I certainly will miss you and we just wish you uh, all the very best and uh, thank you for all your concerns. Appreciate it. And when I saw him on Thursday, he was still in a lot of pain. They were still trying to regulate his meds. I think hopefully uh, he's doing better now. But... Uh, yeah, keep praying for him. Vic is not one to like to sit still, so it'll be an interesting time for him. So we'd love to see everybody back on uh, Friday, Good Friday at 10.30. We have a Good Friday service, and uh, it'll be a little different from our regular service, a little bit more uh, toned down as we think about the cross and what Christ did for us in his death. And then we want to welcome you back again next Sunday and encourage you to invite your friends and let's celebrate Easter Sunday together. All that God has for us with that. Just a few announcements. Again, just a reminder to give. The email address is on the screen. We do have uh, um, plates. We were going to start doing uh, live offering. Uh, we haven't got there yet, totally missed my mind today, but uh, we're going to start passing around the offering plates just as a reminder and also to give you the option to just put your checks or whatever else, cash, in the offering plates. We stopped it with COVID, but it's time to get going again, right? Yes. Um, we've had a couple of unexpected large bills this week, and so I'd encourage you to keep up your giving and put God first in that area of your life as well. Uh, just a few other things. We had a men's breakfast uh, last, just yesterday. I saw a bunch of men there. If you missed it, uh, if you keep track of your schedule on your announcements and put it in your calendar, you shouldn't miss some of the events. We really want to encourage you to come to prayer. We pray at 9.30 every Sunday morning as well as every Wednesday evening at 6.30. I encourage you to come to that. And a bunch of other things starting up too, especially with Gabriel back. I'm sure he's got some things that uh, he would love for us to do. And uh, yes. And the ladies met for lunch yesterday as well. See, I wasn't there, so I forgot about that one. But thank you for that, Shirley Ann. And... Um, uh, you remember Everell Curry, who passed away not that long ago. Her sister, Pansy, lost her husband less than two weeks ago. So just be praying for her family. And I know for her sons, Eric and Dexton, it's still a, a tough process. So keep praying for them. Uh, Corleana in hospice care right now. It's good to see Carl here today. I will keep praying for your surgery coming up. And uh, God is good. God has been looking after us. I just want to thank God for all the people God is bringing to us. And uh, this past week, we had Mina and uh, Taha come. 
from, they came from India, but from Afghanistan originally. Uh, do you guys want to stand up just for a second here? All right, let's give them a big round of applause. And you may be seated, thanks. And they speak English just fine, so you can get to know them afterwards. Um, I think that's most of the announcements for today. So let's continue to sing. Let's stand together as Haram continues to lead us in worship.
You may be seated. Henry, if you want to come lead us in prayer. Over 30 years ago. Is it my turn? Okay. <laughs> okay. Many years ago, probably 30 or more, I was here in this church and I helped decorate it for Easter. And at the time, the cross was right behind me, in the middle was a large cross. And I had to drape the cloth, as you can see, draped over there on this cross. And I wept, because it represents how Jesus hung on the cross. And seeing that this morning, it brings back all those memories. God was present then, God is present now. I want you to be aware of that. Be open to that. Let, let God's presence touch your heart. Let's turn to him in prayer. Lord, there are some that are ill, some that have been in times of illness. And Lord, so we bring before you Coraliana Smith, Vic, as we saw on the video, Robin, Carl, he's with us this morning, and he's going to have his operation soon, Lord. And surely Anna's had her arm operated on. And we bring them all before you, and others, sort that I'm not aware of, that have had health difficulties in the past week. We bring their needs before you. And we thank you for hearing and answering prayer. You're always there for us. Jesus showed us, Lord Jesus, you showed us when you came riding in victory into Jerusalem. But you showed your humility. You weren't on a stallion, a horse. You were on a donkey. And Lord, I bring our needs before us that we may be following his example to be like that. Yes, victorious, but also humble. Jesus suffered, and many will suffer, but the suffering has a purpose. And let us then, O oh Lord, approach your throne of grace knowing that you have a purpose. We need to learn things. We have to learn to be patient, to be kind, and to have others also in our prayers, not just looking at our own problems. So continue to teach us in our difficulties. And Lord, we pray for those of us who have been living here for many years, and you've blessed us with abundance. Help us to look on our new brothers and sisters even though some of them don't speak our language, we want to embrace them because it isn't a language requirement to serve you, just love for Jesus Christ and his, what he's done for us. And help us, O oh Lord, to be humble in ourselves and then be led by your spirit and not insist on our own way. Bring us to unity, O oh Lord. Let those of us who can help, help. Let those of us, O oh Lord, who need help to be willing to accept that. And in it all, may your name be praised. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Doctor, do you want to come and read the scripture? Or whoever is? Oh, perfect. Matthew 21, 
quantify as as they approached Jerusalem and came to Bethel on the Mount of Olive Jesus sent to disciples saying to to them go to the village ahead of you and you will and you you at once will find a donkey tied there with a coat by her and untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, the Lord needs them and and he will send them right away. This took place to fill what was spoken through the prophet. Say to daughter I am see you can come to you gently and riding on a donkey and on a cloak full of a donkey. Ephesians 4, verses 1 to 3. I, therefore, a prisoner for the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace. Now we're going to do a prayer for unity as a church body. God help our church body to walk in the manner worthy of the calling you have given us. Help us in all our interactions with one another to be humbly and gentle hearts. Grant us patience for one another, bearing with one another in love. Grant the body of Christ's unity. May we walk humbly with you, God, allowing you to show us our wrongs. Amen. Amen. Time for Sunday school, and if the other kids want to go down too, boys, if you guys want to go down to Sunday school, that would be great. You know, this is a perfect example why we need humility and grace, because kids, 
um, do unexpected things and sometimes communication happens that's not so good. So uh, we didn't want to miss out on that. That was great. Thanks, guys. Let's just pray as we look into God's Word, shall we? God, I just thank you for our kids. Thank you for bringing us kids from all over the world. And like Henry said, we don't have to have a special language to speak to you. But we just thank you so much that you speak all of our heart languages. You speak into each person's heart here today. Thank you for your grace in coming to us and serving us as a humble king. Go before us as we look into your word in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm going to give you a little bit of a history lesson. In Greek mythology, there's a story told of a god named Narcissus. Narcissus was fathered by the river god to a nymph named Liriope. Liriope was told by a prophet that Narcissus would reach old age if he failed to recognize himself. Well, Narcissus turned out to be a very handsome young man whom everybody loved. However, there was no one that Narcissus would return his affections to. Nobody was good enough for him, I guess. And uh, there was one lady who especially fell in love with him. Her name was Echo, from which we get the English word Echo. And you can read her story another time. But she was a nymph who one day spotted and fell in love with Narcissus. But Narcissus rejected her because he was more caring about himself. And since Narcissus denied everyone his love, the gods fated that Narcissus would never have anything that he loved. One day while Narcissus was hunting, he went to get a drink at a nearby lake and he bent down to drink the water. But as he bent down, it was a calm day and he could see this face in the water and he fell in love with the reflection of himself. And he was so awed by this person that he couldn't move. And he tried to grab the image, but he couldn't, which made him even more infatuated with himself. Narcissus stayed there without sleep or food. And he called to the gods and asked why he was being denied the love that the two of them shared. And he started to talk to the reflection, and he claimed that he would not leave the one he loved, and that he would die, they would die as one. And so crazy with love, Narcissus stayed by the side of the water and wasted away and died there. Echo came and mourned his passing, and they were going to have a funeral for him, but they tr it turned out that his body became a flower that became the Narcissus flower. And Narcissus has led to the English word narcissism, which has come to mean an excessive interest or admiration of oneself, and especially our physical appearance. Does that sound at all familiar today? I want everybody to do a little uh, assignment. I don't normally do this, but I want everybody to pull out your phone. Everybody pull out your phone if you've got one. Most of you do. Come on, you can be brave and do it. And just hold it up like you're going to take a selfie. Okay? Okay, you can put that away now. Put it far, far away now. Did you know the word selfie wasn't even invented to 2002? We spent thousands of years without these things. And yet today, most of us are going to pull it out and look at it in this reflection hundreds of times every day. In fact, people even post pictures of themselves taking a picture of themselves. 
It's crazy what we do these days. We are obsessed with ourselves, you know, and we pull it out. We, we don't just use this to take pictures anymore. We, do, we t turn it on, turn the camera on, just to look and see how we're doing. Like we use it like a mirror. And then we take a picture. And then we post it. And then if we don't like it, we delete it and put a different one up. And we're doing this constantly. And people are obsessed. The whole world is obsessed with ourselves. In fact, if you think of the word community, it used to be that community was the people around you where you live. So, for example, if you lived in North Mount, your community would be the people around us. And we would get to know each other and there would be a community events with the people in this area. If you look around today, that is rarely the case. Community is now, we take this phone out, we look in it, and we pull things up that we like, and we build a community around our interest. Isn't that interesting? There are some people that belong to the community of, let's say, Flat Earth people, or Harry Potter, or you name it. There is a community out there that you can become a part of right here. That's your community. And into this narcissistic, selfie kind of obsessed world, the Son of God enters with a very different approach. I want you to turn back to the passage that the kids read earlier from Matthew chapter 21, where we find a different approach that we would do well Parents do well to take the time to help our kids with. And young people, take the time to really ponder the way your Savior and Lord Jesus came into this world. Let's read it again. Why don't we stand up to honor the Word of God? Let's stand up and let's read this together. And this time, let it really sink in. As they approached Jerusalem... And came to Bethpage on the Mount of Olives. Jesus sent two disciples, saying to them, Go to the village ahead of you, and at once you will find a donkey tied there, with her colt by her. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, say that the Lord needs them, and he will send them right away. This took place to fulfill what was spoken through the prophet. Say to the daughter of Zion, See, your king comes to you, gentle and riding on a donkey, and on a colt, the foal of a donkey. Thank you. You may be seated. And incidentally, when it says, Say to the daughter of Zion, uh, the daughter Zion was typic a typical word used in Jewish culture to refer to Jerusalem. So in the minds of everybody listening and seeing Jesus riding into Jerusalem, they would recall this passage, this passage on the screen from Zechariah. And the amazing thing about Palm Sunday is not that the long-awaited king parades into town with a flare of a celebrity, this is not a king who's born in a palace, who's nurtured by world-class tutors and nannies, surrounded by accomplished generals. He's not trumpeting into this, this great city to conquer his fo foes and lay claim to a crown. If you follow the media, if you follow the media today of the dictators of the world, the pictures we often see are military parades to flaunt their power, to intimidate their enemies, and to say, look at me. If you follow me, I will wipe out everybody. We'll win the day if you follow me. And it's done with control and intimidation. And instead, here we find this Nazarene, this backwater, this country boy 
purported a lot of rumors around that he was conceived in shame. The parents weren't even married. Born in a stable, in an animal shed. He was a carpenter by trade, riding not on a horse, which you would assume for a king of an army in the first century would ride on, but the offspring, the colt, the foal of a donkey. In modern terms, it would be like the crowd expecting an army general to come in in a tank or in a bulletproof vehicle and instead riding into Jerusalem, let's say a minivan or something. It just doesn't fit, right? It's humble. And he comes, he doesn't come to brandish a sword and say, we're going to beat the enemies. I mean, that was the popular expectation. The crowds that were cheering the palm branches, they were not cheering because they expected this king. I mean, I mean this, this, they didn't expect the Jesus they got. They were expecting this king that was going to wipe out the Romans. This is a king who comes ready to die, to be killed. He's not accompanied by soldiers and generals but by 12 bumbling disciples who desert him at the cross, who don't get it. That's the people he chooses. One of them's going to betray him. The rest will scatter. So think about Palm Sunday and think about what was Jesus thinking? Why was Jesus choosing a humble entry? into Jerusalem. He had the crowds eating out of his hands. They all wanted to take pictures of this king so they could post it on Facebook. Look who I've got for my king. They are all expecting somebody who is going to wipe out the Romans, who's going to give them what they want. And they throw their cloaks on the path before him. This is their king. Imagine this king coming, riding on a donkey. See, in first century, if Caesar had come into town, what do you think he would have done? He would have had tons of soldiers around him. He would use those soldiers to keep the crowds away. If they needed to be killed, it's no big deal. Wipe them out. Get them out of the way. And march into town. Strut his stuff. Show them who's boss. They would have been scared. And yet Jesus, everywhere he went, he went with gentleness and humility and a servant heart. He allows beggars, lepers even, to touch him. He moves into the crowds. They can interrupt his schedule. They can speak into his life. Jesus, could you teach me about this? Okay, let's just stop, disciple. Let's address this. He would do that. It was okay. And he cared for the downtrodden. He put children on his knee while the disciples are saying, "Not uh, Jesus, we don't have time for kids right now. So there's several reasons why Jesus approaches in a humble way. Humble people are more approachable. If you want to share Jesus with people, we need to be humble. We need to be willing to walk among the crowds. We need to be low enough that we are not offended by the blind and the lepers and the weak and the broken. 
People, let us never get so proud that we are unapproachable. Let us not be so angry that people stay away from us. Let us not be so controlling and so, you, you know, we have a saying in English called a KIA. It's not the car, Kia. It's called a know it all. Anybody know a know it all? You just say anything and say, oh, yeah, I know that. Oh, I know better. They're not approachable. It's pride saying, I know everything. I know more than you do. We got to take away everything that makes us unapproachable. And it starts with humility and gentleness. Secondly, humility allows us to serve rather than be served. See, great kings of this world, they want to be served. Everybody is milling around to serve them. Even at the Last Supper, just before Jesus dies, all the disciples are looking at this king of theirs. And saying, Jesus, can we serve you supper? And Jesus says, actually, I'm going to wash your feet. And they're going, what? You're a king. You can't wash my feet. And Jesus says, no, I need to wash your feet. Of all the things he could have done on that last day, knowing he's going to die, he chooses to wash their feet. Do you think Jesus was humble? And if we say we follow him, more than anything else, people need to know that we are humble. They are willing to serve. See, without humility, you can't serve. If Caesar walked into town, there is nothing on his mind about serving the people. The only way he serves the people is by collecting their taxes. Getting something that he wants from them. They, you serve me. And so when Jesus rides into Jerusalem, while all the people were taking their selfies and everything's going viral, Jesus is saying, I am here to serve. Can you handle that in following Jesus? See, as a pastor, there are some of you that are very thankful that I helped in some way in your life. That's a real danger. I could milk that. I could use that to say, yeah, aren't I pretty good? No. If it was not for the grace of God in allowing me to be born in this country... If it was not for the grace of God in giving me good parents, if it was not for the grace of God in so many ways, I wouldn't be doing anything. It's because of Jesus that I can do anything. Which is the reason why we need to keep that balance of staying humble because we have to come back to recognizing who we really are. Humility helps us keep perspective. That it's not all about us. That we are not God. That this whole journey in this world is not about what I get. And humility allows us to to serve. And the problem is, when our focus is too much on ourselves, we just don't get Jesus. And if you're having a hard time understanding what Jesus wants for you, and if you're fighting the things that Jesus wants for you, maybe you're looking at yourself too much and not going to Jesus enough. Do you remember the story where the disciples and Jesus go up on the Mount of Transfiguration? Do you remember that story? Just, just kind of nod if you do. Yes. Some of you are alive. Good. Good. So imagine this mountain. We don't know which mountain it is. Maybe one of you guys does, but I just read in my Bible. They're on the mountain. Maybe it was Mount of Olives. I don't know. Anyways, the disciples are all up there. Remember what happens? Moses and Elijah appear, and Jesus is talking to them. And what are the disciples doing? If they could have, if they could have, I can guarantee you. Quick, take a picture. This is amazing, right? I'm going to post this one, right? 
And when they were all done, all the disciples saying, hold on a second, Jesus. We need more pictures. Let's stay here in the moment. Let's get this on camera. This is good. And I would imagine that Jesus and Moses and Elijah, they're not taking selfies. They're talking about where God is going. They're talking about the future. I'll bet they're talking about Jesus dying on the cross, the resurrection, the future of all these people coming to him and many other things. But the disciples are caught up in the moment because it's about them, right? And when it's all over, they say, Jesus, let's just build some tents and let's just stay here. This is awesome. This is great. Let's get more pictures because it's good. And they didn't get it, what Jesus was up to. And when our focus is too much on ourselves, we don't get Jesus. We don't understand why Jesus would die. We don't understand why we need to deny ourselves daily, take up our crosses and follow Jesus. And Jesus reminds us of his death to come while we want to capture the moment and stay in the moment. Jesus says, no, you have to come down from the mountain and go back to work. You've got to come down from the high of Sunday morning, and you've got to go serve me the rest of the week. See, that's what narcissism does. It wants to capture the moment with us at the center. And often we, when we ask Jesus, what do you want me to do today? We're not really asking, what do you want me to do today? We're saying, Jesus, what, do you, what could you possibly want for me that I would like to do? And we need to move into the center of God's heart and find out, what is it that will give me joy? And what will give you joy is being at the center of God's will in serving Him. Amen? Amen. And then thirdly, humility allows us to focus on God's agenda. When we may wake up tomorrow morning, many of us are going to head off to work. If you're retired, you've got something that you're planning on doing. What will your agenda be? And for many of us, our day is about getting what we want. Now, of course, we don't look at work that way. I mean, we're working for somebody else and we're serving them. But so much of our work is about, I am going to work so I can get more money, so I can get more toys, so I can get a house, so I can get what I want, so that I can get ahead. But what if we knelt down in humility each morning and said, God, what do you want today? What's your agenda today? You know what would happen? The next time we have to go to Jerusalem, we wouldn't be looking at the crowds. We'd be looking at the cross. We'd be looking at where God wants us to serve. And instead of going to work because there's money waiting for us to make there, we're going to work because Jesus is going to make us help us deny ourselves so we can actually help somebody there and serve Him in telling others about Jesus. And the good news of the cross. See, that's where the true adventure begins. If you follow me, many of my days are full of adventure. It's not easy. Just ask Amin and Abdul Aziz. Yesterday was a hard day. But it was fun, too. Because I knew that Jesus was among us. Fourthly, humility allows us to die to ourselves and receive God's grace. Nobody dies to themselves without humility. Humility is the posture of not seeing yourself at the center of the universe. Humility is the choice to elevate others above yourself. Humility is the only way we can actually hear others 
actually hear what God is speaking to us. But here's the incredible good news. When we humble ourselves like a little child, see, they have a lot of humility. They don't care what you think. (laughs) They're just enjoying life. But when we humble ourselves, God actually wants to pour out His grace on you. Amen? How many of you want more of God's grace? How many of you want to experience joy? There is so much stuff in this world that will rob you of joy. And the ironic and paradoxical thing about Christianity is actually when you humble yourself and deny yourself, God gives you more grace and joy. The Old Testament says is if we humble ourselves and pray, God will heal us. God will heal our land if we humble ourselves and pray. In James chapter 4, verse 6 and 7, it says that God resists the proud. But what does he do? He gives grace to the humble. And God doesn't just give a little speck to the humble. He pours it on us because he's a good and generous God. See, this is why the Bible says that Jesus came full of grace. How could he do that? Because he started in a humble position, born in a manger, raised as a carpenter, Galilean no less. Not the best pedigree. Listen how God rewards him. Philippians chapter 2. In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus. What was that? Who being in very nature God, think about this. Jesus is just as powerful as God. Jesus is God. God did not consider equality with God something to be grasped or used to his own advantage, but rather he made himself nothing. He chose to not grasp after that, makes himself nothing, and takes the very nature of a servant. Some translations say a slave. He's not his own. Being made in human likeness and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death. Wow. Even death on a cross, which was the most shameful event in the known world at the time. Even to death on a cross, like a criminal, like a murderer, in the same room as them. That's how far he humbled himself. Is that in your agenda today? But get this. Therefore, God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow and every tongue confess in heaven and on earth and under the earth. Confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of the Father. And one day all of us will be in heaven together praising God and worshiping our Savior. Amen. And all of that would not happen if Jesus had not humbled himself. So think about all that awaits you if you start with a position of humility. If you start with a position of living under Jesus. Because when that starts, your life becomes an adventure. Your life becomes joy. You will be invigorated even when you're doing the hard jobs. Working with the tough people. God will do incredible things through you. See, without humility, there is no heaven. Jesus was exalted because he allowed himself to be humble humbled himself before his father that he was equal with. See, all of us here in God's eyes are equal. But we can choose 
to humble ourselves even lower, to be obedient even to death. Are you willing to humble yourself so that someone else might find Jesus? It really is a lot of fun holding these things, isn't it? I know some of you. I've seen the look in your face when you're looking at this. It's a lot of fun. But we miss out on so much with this. So much. We need to come back to Jesus. We look into the tantalizing screens, but we miss out on joy. And part of the reason, the more we look at that screen, we do it because we're looking for something that will fill us. And it doesn't. So we keep coming back until we die, like Narcissus. And Jesus says, come to me, and I will fill you like no screen can ever do. This morning as we come to the communion table, Let's take a step back from the glow of our reflection in our little screens or whatever else, and selfies, and self-obsession, self-promotion. Let's move forward into the strength of Jesus and his love. Because the truth is, without the strength of Jesus, none of us will take the humble step of taking up our cross daily and following him. Let's pray as Haram comes to lead us. Lord, I thank you for this morning. Give us the courage to deny ourselves daily and follow you. God, through your spirit, remind us of the one thing that is keeping us from serving you. And take, allow you to take it out of our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. I don't know if we're all set up for communion yet in terms of who's volunteering, but if we could get four people to come and help us. Just if God's Spirit is saying it's time for you to come help us, great. First four up here will be great. And uh, we will serve communion to you. And as we prepare our hearts, Haram will come and lead us. Jesus 
spring new wine out of me. Jesus, spring new wine out of me. When Jesus called his disciples into that upper room for that last meal, he expected them all to share the meal with him. Sometimes in church history, we've used this meal to keep people away. I know people who were not members, who were not of the right denomination, who had to sit at the back of the church and couldn't participate. I find it interesting that when Jesus had that first meal, the disciples were all over the map in terms of their beliefs, in terms of their uh, sin that week. And Jesus invited them all there. We don't want to use this meal to keep you away. Having said that, Paul also says that it's important to examine your heart. I don't think Jesus, or I don't think Judas got all the benefits of that meal because his mind was elsewhere. It's important for us to take a moment right now to examine your heart and just say, God, forgive me for the things that are keeping me from you this morning. And then Jesus wants to welcome you to this table. When you have a meal in your home and you invite your friends over, you don't get them to check in at the door and just see what kind of mood they're in, everything before they get to have the meal. We invite them over because they're our friends and we have a meal together. And Jesus wants us to share this meal together. The world will know the love of Jesus when we share this meal together in all of our diversity. Because it is the unity in Christ that gives us strength. And so let's come to this meal and celebrate what God has done for us in Jesus. Henry, can you come and just pray and thank God for his broken body for us? Oh, gracious. In a second. There it is. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we come here and we're humbled by your sacrifice that you gave as a father. And Lord Jesus, for your willingness to bring that sacrifice. And we surrender ourselves to you. Mm -hmm. And yes. we want to celebrate this meal because you instituted for us to be strengthened by it, to be encouraged by it, and to be led by it. Yeah. May you receive all the glory in your Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.
Jesus organized his disciples to make, get the meal ready. He wanted to celebrate with them. And as they're sharing the meal, he said, this is my body broken for you. Let's eat it together in remembrance of Jesus. Isn't it amazing? This one loaf of bread is in all of us equally, the same bread. Jesus is in every one of us. There isn't any one of us that has less or more of Jesus than anybody else. In Jesus' eyes, we're all equal. And Jesus, after the meal, he took the cup of wine. He says, this represents a new covenant. Now, they had had an old covenant, all kinds of laws and rules. But Jesus puts a new covenant in our hearts through his shed blood. And Jesus wanted to make sure they understood it so well that when he died on the cross, he let the blood spill out everywhere and profusely from his head, from his side, from his hands, his back, everywhere the blood flowed. There was nobody there who would have missed the fact that Jesus was shedding his blood. Not all of them knew why, but we do. Jesus said, this blood is a new covenant in my blood forever. Let's celebrate what Jesus has done in his shed blood. James, would you come and pray and thank God for his shed blood? We thank you, Heavenly Father God, for the sacrifice of your Son. And we thank you, Lord Jesus, that you humbled yourself and was obedient to our Father in Heaven, that you came for us and you died for us. Mm -hmm. We thank you that you shed your blood. And as Pastor Greg said, that this blood, this wine, represents his blood that was shed for us. We thank you, Father God, that we can come to you freely, that we can do these things, that we can partake of these ceremonies in a communion. We thank you, Heavenly Father God, for all of the things that you have done, and we ask that you bless this, this wine that represents the blood of Jesus Christ. Yeah. In Jesus' name we pray.
And after the meal, Jesus took the cup, said, this is my body, my blood shed for you. Let's drink it together. Well, God has been here this morning. Amen? Amen. We have an incredible God. Let's, uh, in closing, stand together and let's sing this song, Waiting Here for You. If they can can move move the mountains, mountains, let the the mountains move. Come with expectation, waiting here for you. Waiting here for you, with our hands lifted high in praise, and it's you. May Jesus, our King of kings, make his rule known in your life. May you echo the crowds as Jesus entered Jerusalem, who praised and celebrate their King, even though they didn't know the nature and scope of his saving plan. May the glory of our King give you strength and excite you with reasons to worship, even as we pray for his saving power over our world. May Jesus' humility as he draws near to heal us of our sin, give you hope that while we face this present storm and darkness, Jesus, the ultimate healer of our souls, will one day make all things new and right. In the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, amen. You may be seated.